This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to look at the subject of being ready for war. Number one, if you're going to be ready for war, you need to be strong in the grace. 2 Timothy 2, 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If you're really strong, then it isn't your own strength. You're a weakling compared to other beings in existence. Because 2 Peter 2.11 says the angels are greater in power and might. And God created the angels. The one who created the angels lives in you. That is where you're truly strong is when, you're, when you put things in his hands. So be strong in Christ. As it says in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his, num power of his might. 2 Corinthians 12.10 Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So you're strongest when you're weak. Because when you're weak, you put your faith on Him, the one that's really strong. So if you're ready for war, then you're strong. Because the Lord is a man of war and He is in you. The Lion of the tribe of Judah lives in you. So if you're ready for war, you're strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And next, if you're ready for war, then you're faithful. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So Timothy was supposed to teach faithful men what Paul taught. And that was more than just the fundamentals. It was more than just... Pauline doctrine because Paul says in Acts 20 27 for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God so it was even the entire Old Testament that should be taught Romans 15 4 says for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope so Timothy is supposed to teach what Paul taught to faithful men so that they may teach others also. And if you're faithful to what Paul taught, then you're a Bible believer who is faithful to the words and sound doctrine. And you should have qualified men teaching. This is lacking today when people are looking to Kanye West as the greatest source for spiritual instruction. You need someone who's faithful. And if you're ready for war, you're going to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and you're going to be faithful and maybe you weren't faithful in the past that doesn't mean you can't change that and get faithful today and next if you're ready for war then you're not going to be a sissy in 2 Timothy 2 3 it says there therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ men today are sissies men should get up and act like men push through some suffering and adversity Today, men don't want to push through suffering. In 1 Peter 2, 19 through 21, it says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrong wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. If you're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven's greatest soldier, he suffered. Suffering is a huge part of being a soldier in the Lord's army because friends will forsake you, your wife may leave you, your husband may end up hating you, your kids rebel, the devil gets you down, you get doors slammed in your face. Maybe a Christian suffering through extreme temptations to sin well, all, that would be a suffering to them. You can suffer and fight it. Second Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Someday you are going to face persecution if you haven't already. You may not be getting your head cut off, but you may get spit on, yelled at, fired from your job. At the least, maybe get put in Facebook jail. Uh, thank God we don't live in a country where you get your head chopped off yet, but it's coming. A soldier will endure hardness. The sissy man won't endure hardness. Second Timothy 2.9 says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, 
even under bonds, but the word of God is not bound. So Paul is sticking his neck out for the Lord so much he is doing it even under bonds, meaning he's getting locked up just like the criminal would. He's getting locked up as an evildoer, but the word of God is not bound. You can't put a limit on it. It isn't limited to a certain group of Christians. Every Christian from every sect of Bible believers can open it and get something out of it. It's not limited to a certain period of time or age group. From young kids to 90 years old, they can get something from it. Paul says in verse 10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So Paul endured shipwrecks, beating with rods, slander, uh, fastings, imprisonments, and many dangers through his life just so he could get people saved and have them saved with eternal glory after they get saved meaning he not only wanted them to get saved but wanted them to be saved and working so that they could get rewards in heaven saved with eternal glory second timothy 2 10 therefore i endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in christ jesus with eternal glory Yo, so you're not elect until you're saved some teach God only saves the elect, but you're not even elect until you get saved. Verse 11 says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. When you get saved, the Lord considers your flesh to be dead, so you have to reckon your flesh dead daily. That's why Paul says in Romans 6, 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I protest by your rejoicing which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. When you get saved, your spirit is made alive and your flesh dies. So if you want to live life to the fullest, as they say, then walk in the spirit because it's alive. When you walk in the flesh, you're being controlled by a dead corpse. When you learn that you need to yield yourself to God, then you really start living like you're leaving. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In the sense that you're already in the body of Christ, you are already sitting in, Christ, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And being saved and living the crucified life is getting as close as you can get to heaven while you're still on this earth. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. A good soldier en endures hardness. He endures suffering. You're not a child or a sissy if you're in the Lord's army. If you suffer with God because all that live godly in Christ Jesus so suffer persecution, then you're going to reign with him in the kingdom. If you deny him before men, then he will deny you your reign. He won't deny your salvation because you're born again, you can't get unsaved, but he will deny your reign. You won't reign over as many cities. You see, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will deny us. What's the context? He'll deny your reign. Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. This verse proves eternal security. I'm in the body of Christ. Since I'm in him, he can't deny me. Because then he would be denying himself. I'm a member of the body of Christ. If he denies me, he denies himself. Someone may ask, what if you get saved and quit believing? You're still saved. A person could get saved and talked out of their faith by a college professor or atheist. But if that person truly came to a place where they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ with the heart to save them, then they're saved. And it doesn't matter what anybody says. It doesn't matter what any preacher says. If a person believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and truly believed from the heart, then they're saved. And God said that himself. So the saved person would still be saved, but deceived if they quit believing. So love not the world. If you're going to be a soldier in the Lord's army, if you're going to be ready for war, Love not the world. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him 
to be a soldier. So some people are more concerned with the gossip and lies on magazine covers than they are with reading the Bible. They are more concerned with celebrity gossip on the e-news stuff than they are about the things of God. They'll sit around and just look at celebrity stuff all day long. But if you're going to war, then you need to set your affection on things above. If, you go to, if you're going to war, then you don't need to be concerned with the, the affairs of this life. Some Christians are more into politics. They care more about who uh, Trump is doing than anything. They know so much about Trump or about the politicians, or the, the higher-up people. They know more about these people than they know about the people in the Bible, than they know about the kings in the Old Testament. But if you're going to be ready for war, you need to know some things about the Word of God. You don't need to entangle yourself in the affairs of this life. And next, if you're ready for war, then you're in shape for battle. In 2 Timothy 2, 5, it says, And if any man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So 1 Timothy 4, 8 says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So put yourself through some spiritual boot camp if you're going to be in shape for battle. Reading, memorizing, meditating, praying, and putting all of these things into use. Strive for masteries, but strive lawfully. Try to be the best Bible teacher, but don't change the Bible trying to do so. You need to strive lawfully. Win souls to Jesus Christ, but don't be deceitful to win them to Jesus Christ. You don't have to use rock music and worldly means to try to win people. Just strive lawfully. Do it how the Bible says to do it. But if you're ready for war, then you're going to be in shape for battle. If you're ready for war, then you're going to be a worker. 2 Timothy 2.6 says, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. So the husbandman, which is a farmer is the first partaker of the fruits he labors for. And when you first get saved, many times God will give you a glimpse of how great the things of God are and maybe let some victories fall into your lap just to show you how great serving God is. So the husband, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits. He will put some victories on you, the Lord will put victories on you, so that you will want to work more. And if you're ready for war, then you're ready for work. What do you think of when you think about a farmer, somebody that's a worker, someone that gets up and works all day? That's what you need to do if you're going to be ready for war. You need to be ready to read, ready to study, ready to witness, ready to pray, ready to fight temptation. And next, if you're ready for war, then you will know your weapon. You can't be ready for war if you don't know your weapon. You get out there and get shot before you can figure out how to use it. 2 Timothy 2, 7 says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Verse 8, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So do you know the basic, basic doctrines of the Bible? Do you know your weapon? Your weapon's the Word of God. Do you know the basic things in the Word of God? Paul mentions them all the time. Here he mentions the resurrection. He mentions the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as he preached it in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And if Hebrews 4, 12 shows us the Bible is a sword, your weapon, then you need to know your weapon. And that is why in verse 15, Paul says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. First thing you need to realize is that there are very basic divisions in the Bible. Just looking at it, you obviously see an Old Testament division and then the New Testament. And to break it down in simplest form, being a dispensationalist simply means that you believe that God deals with man the way but you believe how God deals with man has changed throughout the Bible. A dispensation is God dispensing something. And God did this throughout the Bible, even though he himself never changes. Whether or not you want to identify it as a dispensationalist or not doesn't really matter. Any serious student of the Bible sees differences and very basic divisions throughout the Scripture, even if they don't label themselves as a dispensationalist. And I'm going to show you clear verses that will show you divisions. For example, 
John 1 17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So if you're going to rightly divide, you can clearly see that the law was given by Moses. So if the law was given by Moses, then obviously there was a time before the law because there was a time before Moses. Then it says in Matthew eleven thirteen, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. So if the law was given by Moses and the law and the prophets were until John, then that shows there was a time after the law. Then in Hebrews 9.16 it says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. If the New Testament starts with the death of the testator, the Lord Jesus Christ, this shows yet another division. So just from these few verses you see a time before the law, a time during the law, a time during Jesus' earthly ministry, and then the New Testament. And I believe there's more than that. I'm just showing you basic divisions that there's Bible verses for that you can plainly see. And many people criticize dispensationalists, but yet they are one themselves. Just because you don't label yourself that doesn't mean you don't believe in basic division. Because to break it down simply, a dispensationalist just believes that the way God deals with people changes. And if you don't believe that, then why are you not sacrificing animals? Why are you not keeping the Sabbath? Why are you not abstaining from certain meats or building a boat or abstaining from eating off of a tree? You know good and well that you believe in basic divisions. You believe in that there's changes. And if, if you believe that, then you're really not believing any different than a dispensationalist. So you should really quit bashing dispensationalists because you're actually one yourself. But next, if you're ready for war, you need to work as a team. In 2 Timothy 2.14, it says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. You see, arguing about doctrine is mostly striving about words to no profit. That is all many ministries have become as every preacher trying to straighten out all the other preachers. And, but they're mostly just subverting the hearers to false teachings. Because it says in verse 15 that many times they don't study to show their self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Instead of working as a team together to exalt Jesus Christ in the King James Bible, they attack with words to no profit. And also, as it says in verse 16, it says to shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. These men have profane and vain babblings, like the Pharisees complaining about the disciples not washing their hands when their own bodies were full of dead men's bones. The sins of the mouth just increase to more ungodliness. It's contagious. That's why. You get around someone like that and you'll start doing it. That's why men who sit under certain men can't get along with their own house cat because their pastor can't get along with anybody but himself. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18 says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So the first resurrection has three parts. Revelation 20 and verse 6 says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests with God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the first resurrection has three, three parts. In 1 Corinthians 15 you see Christ is the first fruits. And when he resurrected the Old Testament saints got up out of the graves as well. As it says in Matthew twenty-seven fifty-two through 53, And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves, and after his resurrection went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So you see, that's Christ, the first fruits with the Old Testament saints. That's one part of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty-three. But every man in his own order, Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that, are, they that are Christ's at his coming. So Christ, the first fruits. And then they that are Christ that is coming. Us saved people will be resurrected when Jesus Christ comes in the rapture, which you read about in 1 Thessalonians 4, especially see verses 16 and 17. And then the third part of the first resurrection has to do with the tribulation saints being resurrected. So you have first fruits, harvest, 
and the gleanings. And now these two guys, this Hymenaeus and Philetus, were going around during Paul's day saying the resurrection is past already, so they would probably be teaching that we were already reigning on earth now. But from reading Revelation, we can easily tell that isn't true because Satan isn't bound in the bottomless pit right now. But he will be when we're reigning for a thousand years. And then it says in 2 Timothy 2.23, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. You know what troublemakers do? They go around asking questions like, Why doesn't God heal amputees? Can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it? Why does God allow bad things to happen to children? You know, things like this, trying to overthrow the faith of people with foolish and unlearned questions. But if you're ready for war, you're going to gird up your loins like the new man. You ever heard somebody say, act like a man? Well, you need to act like the new man. In 2 Timothy 2.19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal... The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In Job 8, 11, or John at 11, it says, And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. If you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. We aren't saved by abstaining from sin. And we aren't saved because we do abstain from sin, but we should still abstain from sin. If you're not trying your best to live right, then you're putting on you're not putting on the new man, and you aren't ready for war because someone in war is most likely praying to God that he doesn't get killed. It's a lot harder to pray when you are living for the devil. The Lord knows them that are his, as the verse said, and there are three people that know if you're saved, and that's you and God and the devil. I don't know you're saved. I just have to take your word for it. I have to believe your profession or your testimony, but God sees your heart. Now, even though people don't truly know that you're saved, you should still act like a saved man because all they have is your testimony and they see if you act like a Christian. So you need to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. As it says in 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If you purge yourself from these, what are these? I believe in the context that these are all the bad things Paul has listed in the chapter. For example, profane and vain babblings, striving about words to no profit, false doctrine, saying the resurrection is past already when it, when it isn't, and so forth and so on. Purge yourself from these, and you will possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. You'll be meeting, you'll be meat for the master's use. Meat, as in to match. You'll, you'll be sanctified. You'll be set apart. But you also need to flee also youthful lust, as it says in verse 22, and follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So flee youthful lust. In other words, if you see sin, run. Real men run from sin. Follow righteousness. Click the follow button on righteousness. Subscribe to it. Send it to friend request. Put it in your favorites. Put it at the top of your contact list and... Uh, get it to send you notifications and that along with faith because without faith it is impossible to please him and charity which is a love specifically to other christians that backs it up with an action and peace which is something you need to have with your brothers and sisters in christ and you need the peace of god that passes all understanding and notice the end of the verse said with them that call on the lord out of a pure heart showing your fellowship should be with those who are pure, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Next, if you're ready for war, you're going to be servant-minded. In verse 24, it says, And the servant of the Lord must be not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. And moving on a bit further, be aware of the enemy. In 2 Timothy 2.16 it says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. If you're ready for war, then you're going to have to know the enemy. Similar to how an athlete watches the opponent to see his weakness or how he can have an advantage over their opponent so that his opponent doesn't give an advantage over him. 
of Second Corinthians two eleven says, "Lest Satan should get an advantage over us, of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices." People get caught in the snare of the devil. A Christian can be possessed in the sense that the devil can get his body. Now he can't touch your soul or your spirit, but he can get this flesh, because the flesh isn't saved; it's dead, and the devil can use it as his puppet. Puppet, if you let him. When you see a Christian get caught in the devil's net. You need to take your sharp sword, your sharp two-edged sword, and cut him out. What, what you don't do is write your brother's sin on Facebook. What you don't do is look it up and dig up dirt and all these other things, trying to find out more bad things about him. You need to take your sword and cut your brother or sister out of the net of sin. Take your sword and cut them loose and then build a hedge around them with prayer and exhorting them so that you can defend them against the walls of the devil. And if you can't do that, you're not ready for war. There is no need for friendly fire in this war. Make sure you're aiming the weapon at the enemy and not your fellow soldier. But if you're still listening, this has been 2 Timothy chapter 2 about being ready for war.